Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjark of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first time guest, but I've actually been following his work on Twitter for years. He has a well known investing radio show on iTunes. He is Chief Investment Officer of Bulwark Capital Management, Zach Abraham. Thank you for joining me. Hey, pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me, man. Yes. And your radio show on iTunes, you're the host of Know Your Risk Radio, and you've interviewed a lot of well-known experts like Luke Groman and many others. So happy to get your insights on markets and what you've learned from interviewing all these other experts as well today. Oh, yeah. No, it's been a... It's been a wild ride. We we took a shot at doing uh, <clears throat> a weekend radio show. We were asked to do a weekend radio show about eight years ago on a on a local Seattle station, um, and now we're on three different stations in Seattle: one in Portland, one in Phoenix, and then we podcast the show out. And uh, you know, I, there it's not a huge show, obviously, but there's some people out there that like it, which kind of blows my mind. We we don't have your numbers. Um, we don't, aren't you over like a million views now on, on YouTube? Almost 10 million, but we're not oh, doing geez. that. I used to get, mm, I used to get about 500,000 views a month on uh, wow. YouTube at one point, And then they changed the algorithm and then it collapsed. It's, uh, making money grinding out videos on YouTube is tough. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't. Yeah. It's, it sounds like a, it's a tough racket, but yeah, we, we don't have those numbers, but, but, um, you know, it's been, it's been fun just to be able to, I'm sure you feel like this. I feel like doing these shows and these interviews, it's fun to talk to other people that know what's going on and it's fun to bounce ideas off them. And then I think the other thing that it's really nice, it helps you. I do the show once a week. It really helps you condense and organize your thoughts, you know, and, and, and put things together and think about it. And then the other great thing about it, it gives you a platform to have people on that you otherwise wouldn't get to, you know, we got to have, Robert Schiller on the Nobel winning pri uh, economist and, uh, you know, guys like, uh, you know, yeah, like you said, Luke Groman and Brent John, you know, Grant Williams. And uh, we just, it, it's been awesome. Otherwise you, you know, they'd have no reason to talk to me. So it's been a, it's been a fun, been a fun, interesting journey, certainly an interesting time to do it too. So we're recording this interview on Thursday, September 1st, 2022. The dollar index is on fire. It, I think it briefly touched 110 today. It's at 109.63, give or take. My first question for you is, what do you think are the biggest risks to the global economy right now? Oh, man. <clears throat> I, I, I was describing this to a group of clients the other day where I said, um, I don't think I've seen a time in my career where the distribution outcomes is as flat as it is. And, and where the tails are as pregnant as they are. Um, you know, I could certainly see, you know, I am, I am much more from the Austrian school like you. So I'm looking at, um, you know, from that side of things for tr traditional economic approach, it looks really ugly. And so I think that you have um, cycle fatigue. I, I think you're just, you've, you've, in terms of asset prices, I think they've reached an apex for the cycle. I think the debt loads have become unsustainable, certainly at higher interest rates. Just everything to me about the economic picture, picture screams end of cycle. The, um, the reason why I say I think both tails of the distribution are pregnant, um, you know, we can deal with the left, ta left tail too, obviously, and I think that's going to be the more likely and, and certainly more prescient one. Um, but, you know, there's also that fear in the back of my mind that if things get as nasty as they look, we know what central bank response is going to be. Um, and who knows, especially coming out of the post COVID world, who knows what that response will really look like, the veracity of it, the size of it, you know, cause that's the other thing, right? It's just like a drug. It's just, just like getting addicted to drugs. Every single time you do one of these interventions, every single time you do one of these, I mean, Jason, think about the idea that we thought that $880 billion to bail out the financial center in 2000 or the financial system in 2008, we thought that was absurd, right? That was obscene. Okay. That's just like a Tuesday now, right? Eight hundred <laughs> billion. I mean, you know, that, that's just like going out for beer at the corner store now. Um, you know, we throw that around like, like pennies. So, so that to me is why I say that tails are fat. Now, if we take that out of there and think about, lunacy of of central bankers and and remove that potential and just look at the economic picture i think the two biggest threats to the global financial system outside of outside of so let me back up a little bit i i think the biggest threat to the world economically and total and, and in total right now are similar i i think it is the breakdown of of the um 
the, of globalization and the system that's been, been in place essentially since exiting, you know, or post Bretton Woods. Um, and so in that vein, I think that military conflict is a very, I mean, we've got a, we've got a kinetic war in Europe for the first time in 70 years, 80 years, 70 years. Um, it's, it's, a you know, that's take, that's taken front stage in as far as news goes, but it's also a bit bizarre to me that that isn't more alarming and that people think that the Russia Ukraine thing is going to get fixed easily. Where I look at that as a potential Duke Ferdinand type situation. I'm not saying it's going to be, but I, it's hard to look at it and say that it's not possible. Um, you also wonder if the world's handling of Russia will encourage or discourage China to to get more aggressive on the Taiwan front. So I think there's a lot of military situations and and potential tensions. The other thing that you've got to look at is that this reversal of capital. Uh, flows that were rolling into China for so long, you know, because everybody looks at China's big debt bubble and you're like, look, as long as dollars kept flowing into their economy, they could keep doing this, right? Well, now you look at it and, you know, if you want to know, I, I saw a funny chart the other day. If you want to see the impacts of what's, I think, happening to China right now and what's going to continue to happen to China, go look at Vietnam. Right in the midst of all of this, you and I were talking offline about what a brutal time it is for emerging markets. But go look at Vietnam's economic growth, and then ask yourself why is Vietnam growing like that? It's because they're being they're they're serving as a subsidiary or, or a collection uh, a, a vessel or a bucket of 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 jobs and production that are coming out of China. Um, and so then I look at that picture and I think, okay, their, their economy is booming the way it is because of those inflow of dollars. Those are dollars that are no longer flowing into China. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I, for years, guys like you and I have been talking about it and watching it and knowing that the situation in China was unsustainable, but you had to see a slowdown of dollars. You had to see something disrupt that flow. Well, here we go. And you and I, again, I know, you know, this, I've read a lot of your stuff about it and I think you're dead on point. You stop that inflow of dollars and you could be, I mean, I feel like any morning you wake up, you could be st staring at a 30 to 40% wand devaluation. Um, so I think that's a huge threat. And then outside of that, the other two ones that are really obvious to me is the dollar index where it's at. Um, it amazes me. The longer I do this job, it amazes me how many people that consider themselves to be professional investors completely ignore currencies and rates. and a, right. They are the seeds. If you want to know what crop is going to come up in the fall, the seeds of that, in my opinion, are currency and rates. Look what they're doing in the spring and it'll tell you what kind of crop you're going to yield in the fall. Um, so and if you look at those seeds today, the crop ain't looking too hot. Um, I, I, you know what, Jason, honestly, I, I think the only way I can really sum it up is um, pre COVID. It seemed like no matter what type of lunacy central bankers could come up with, no matter how insane their strategies were, no, how, no matter how wrong-footed legislative action was, it just seemed like the central bankers could take, they could absorb anything and nothing mattered. And the whole world was like, you know, just pinned toward a deflationary angle. And so no matter how much fiscal and everything they threw at it, monetary and fiscal, you just didn't see that inflation. Now, all of those dynamics have literally been flipped on their ears. And now everywhere I look in the world, it is flipped to a competitive landscape um, and a much less cooperative landscape. Um, and, you know, and I think you and I can both agree. One of the reasons that central banks have been able to get away with doing what they've been doing for the last 15 years is coordination, right? If everybody is devaluing at the same time, then nobody's really devaluing. So now all of a sudden those dynamics have shifted, you know, and, and, and I think you can see that in the dollar index, right? The idea that the Fed is planning another 75 bips hike uh, with the dollar index at 110, I think that the, the vast, I think the vast majority of the members of the FOMC are insane. I don't think they're stupid, right? I, I think that they're not wise, but I don't think that they're stupid. I, I, I don't believe that they don't understand the pain and pressure that a dollar index at 110 does. I, 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 I refuse to believe that they're not aware of that. Um, but what they're effectively saying, in my opinion, is that 
domestic issues, Trump international, and we got to do what's best for our own economy, you know, in their language. I, I, I don't but, think they're doing but, anywhere close to that. But, but Zach, if they keep raising interest rates, won't they crash home prices? Won't they spike mortgage rates? Won't that stop consumer spending? Won't that cause a lot of consumer discretionary companies then to go bankrupt in the United States? Yeah, they, they will. And I think, in my opinion, um, I think they are in the situation that, again, I know, guy, I know you've been talking about for some time way prior to COVID, and I have too, which is they are in the situation that you and I knew that they would be in 10 years ago, meaning at some point when inflation came, they were going to have a gun to both sides of their head, and the choice was going to be inflation or market crash. And going into an election year, I think that the, I hate to use the term deep state because it's been so politicized. And I think that, um, you know, and we can have a political discussion, but I, I think that I always make it a point on my, my show to try to stay off the political front because I think it's just, it puts another dynamic. We've got to be conscious of political action, but you and I both know, again, guys that do this for a living, this is a tough enough puzzle to solve if you don't bring political ideology into it. Um, so I'm not making a political statement when I say this at all, but um, I think that they understand the potential damage of raising rate or raising rates. I mean, you and I both know, okay, you take the 30 year treasury from three to 6.23 to close today at 6.23%. There's no way that houses don't pull back. And if you don't believe me, just go run those numbers on $500,000 through a mortgage calculator. It effectively doubles the price of the mortgage payment. I know I've said for years, nobody buys a house, they buy a mortgage. So, you know, how many people can make the largest purchase in their life and not blink because the cost of it doubles over the space of 14 months? So, yeah, I think they realize they do, but I think that they're making a political decision. And I think that the – it's it, it, at least this is my view on it, Jason, in the sense that I can't make sense of it any other way, um, meaning I think that the deep state, if you will, the establishment – thinks that the biggest enemy to the system is Donald Trump. And they are willing to take whatever pain necessary to ensure that he does not get back in office. That that's my that's my read on it. And and let me just also say out there to your listeners, if you've listened to my show before, I am not even close to being a Trump sycophant. So I'm not sitting here in the office with my MAGA hat on, you know, um, you know, bat, you know, pumping Trump all the time. I just, nothing else makes sense to me. So when you look at the constituency, look at the student loans they just forgave, right? Look at what they're doing. I think they're making a coordinated decision to say, look, it, we can, inflation and higher fuel costs and higher power costs and how, and higher, you know, everything costs, um, those hurt our core constituency. Right. And you can, and, and again, look at the student bill, right, right? Who, who is it that they consider their core constituency? I think it hurts their core constituency a lot more than a stock market crash does. So I think they're making a political decision. They've got a gun to both sides of their head and they're choosing market turbulence and asset price turbulence over inflation because it damages their chances of winning an election less, you know? Um, and then the other thing is I think that they, the other part of that philosophy or that idea for me that makes a lot of sense is think about, think about their constituency again. You know, the average, if you think about those on the right or the average Trump supporters, they're going to generally be a lot more in tune and a lot more aware of what's happening in things like the stock market because they probably have more assets. Um, you flip over and look at the average uh, constituency of the left or the av average constituent of the left. I think that on a day-to-day -day basis, they're far more concerned about living costs and food costs and fuel costs. So I think they're just making a political calculation that they're going to have to take pain one way or the other, and it will damage their political cause less to attack inflation um, than it would to, would to take a hit on the asset front. And then I, then I think if you look at the Federal Reserve's actions – um, remember when this all started, they were going to raise rates and we're going um, um, to reduce the balance sheet. If I'm not mistaken, the balance sheet has actually slightly grown over the last 12 months, <laughs> right? So I think that's where they're trying to kind of have their cake and eat it too, where, um, you know, if you were really serious about tamping down inflation, I think trimming the balance sheet would do more good than even raising rates. Problem is, is if you remember the FOMC, 
trimming the balance sheet is far more impactful to the all the all the big firms that you want to hire hire you for three and a half to five million dollars a year as an advisor after you're done with your term with the FOMC. So um, I just think you know I, I I just think very little of this is altruistic. And I think the vast majority of it is political, and I just think they're making a political calculation. I mean, if they keep raising interest rates, there's going to be a math problem because the U.S. government with the national debt can they even afford interest payments at 4%, 5%. Japan's already hitting this with Japanification. If interest rates go up a full 1%, Japan can't even afford a full 1% or 2% increase in interest rates. So, I mean, the Fed's going to be dealing with the same issue too. Then if they crash real estate prices or asset prices stay low for, say, 6, 9, 12 months, then all those capital gains tax receipts, property taxes, sales taxes, all those things that are added on for consumer spending with the wealth effect and then asset price inflation, that uh, all the tax receipts for all levels of government at the federal, state, and local level, all those things go away six, nine, 12 months later, if asset prices stay low for a long period of time. The math just doesn't work, Zach. No, I, I'm i with you. I, I, just think that, <laughs> I just think that that ship sailed. I mean, meaning the math hasn't worked for a long time. Um, and if what you can do, I mean, look, the way I think, if you, okay, so if, if you need to step in as a central bank and you need to buy six to $7 trillion of assets, to maintain rates at a pace so your economy can continue to grow at two and a half to three percent, I'd say you're already there, right? Because you, you know you, you're not made. Every every bit of debt the Fed is buying, the 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 federal government isn't paying interest on that. They are, but then the vast majority of that interest gets returned by the Federal Reserve to the Treasury. So I, you know, and Japan's a perfect example. I think Japan's the roadmap. I think at some point in the not too distant future, you're going to see the Fed balance sheet over 10 trillion. And I think at some point in the not too distant future, as in the next five to seven years, I think you're going to see it approach 15 to 20 trillion. I think they're going to monetize the vast majority of the debt. And when you look at it that way, um, you know, I mean, wh how, how many, you probably know this number better than I do, but wh what percentage of Japanese debt or JGBs are owned by the Bank of Japan? It's a very large percentage that and the their largest pension funds. So it's it's only owned by three large entities. So you have the Japanese banks, which are zombie banks, and those guys yep. failed. Those guys failed what thirty years ago, and then all the accounting rules were changed. I've seen Real Vision presentations about this, and then the Japanese pension funds and the Japanese uh, Japanese uh, central bank. So those are the three main entities who own most of the JGBs. Yeah, and so in this, I mean, it, it, it is. It's absurd to guys like you and I, because on the very face of it, everybody should know that this is completely unsustainable and everybody's attitude seems to be, but yes, if we do this, we don't realize the pain today. I think what people, I don't think, I know for a fact, the average guy on the street has got no clue about this, that th by definition, the longer you delay it, the more painful it actually becomes, right? It's like a surgery, right? The longer you put it off, the worse and more intensive it gets. And you're just building that back pressure. And I sort of think that's what you're seeing happen in um, in energy markets. I, I think that the, you know, the Fed is very good at throwing rocks and they're very bad at the observation of the ripples, meaning you know, they, they really don't it, – it, it shocks me sometimes the fact that they don't consider so many of the knock-on and second and third order effects that come off of their policies – but you know how is it in a world of growing population because it's still growing how is it in a world of growing population and growing economies that you have net negative investment in energy over a decade right i i only think that's possible in a fed induced uh growing fed balance sheet world um you know where you're where you're where you're you know you're artificially suppressing and moving interest rates you, you know it's kind of like the truman show Right, the old old Jim Carrey movie where he's living in that fake environment, um, and you know that that can go on until a dynamic shifts. To me, that dynamic was COVID, um, because we are no longer. I mean, if you look at what our relationship to with China, everybody's like, we didn't have any inflation over the last twenty years. Nonsense. We just exported it all to China. Right, that's where it all went. And you're undoing that now. So what's happening? That inflation is reversing flow, and it's coming right back here to our shores. And I think you're going to see, as has been the case in history, where, you know, inflation hits and it hits different things at different paces and at different times and at different magnitudes. 
And there are always aspects of it. You know, I'm, I consider myself an economic historian. I, I did not come into the last year or the last two years with my eyes on fertilizer or lumber, right. Or, or uh, obscure, more obscure things like that. Um, and inflation ha- does its weird thing. And so I, I think of what you're seeing right now in energy markets is sort of a, a, a pressure kind of coming out of the cracks of the pipes um, where you're watching, you're starting to see ramifications of, of all of these over-involved ce- central banks. And I think when we look back at it through history, we will see the egregious levels of debt and the that they racked on people and they racked on future generations and the currency issues that end up causing, you know, more and increased uh, uh, political strife, potentially more kinetic wars uh, and engagements. Um, and and then on top of that, I think the other thing we're going to look back and see is just a, uh, essentially a generation of malinvestment and misallocation of capital. And, you know, I just think about, I think a perfect example, and this is far too simplistic, but I think it works as an example of we have had negative investment in energy over the last decade, and yet we have car vending machines, right? Like, (laughs) you know, if that is not a poster child of the misallocation of capital, I don't really know what is. Well, it's not just central banks that are causing these energy problems. You've also had bad policy from governments, but what a lot of people don't realize, and I talked about this on a George Gammon interview months ago, was that about 70% of all the global oil and natural gas reserves, they're not owned by the private sector. They're not owned by ExxonMobil or Chevron or Royal Dutch Shell. They're owned by national oil companies. So you have these large countries... um, Most of them are in OPEC, but OPEC plus or these emerging market oil producers or countries like Mexico and Indonesia that are no longer net exporters of oil because they consumed a lot of their own domestic production. So these countries have mismanaged a lot of their oil and natural gas reserves. Maybe in the past they grew production. Now they're not. I mean, even at uh, triple digit oil, the Nigerian National Oil Companies Act did not make a profit. So Saudi, so Saudi Aramco, yeah, because of waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse. So even in yep. triple digit oil, the Nigerian National Oil Company could not make a profit. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's. I mean, it's stunning. Now, interestingly enough, now I'm not sitting here being a big proponent of Nigeria. Interestingly enough, I was shocked to see that I think Nigeria recognizes part. Now, maybe they're just playing to 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 private investment, but they've actually done some things. And this is pretty obscure. Uh, people might ask, "How in the world do you know Nigerian energy policy?" Well, we have a we have a holding that has substantial assets off the coast of Nigeria. So I am biased when I make this statement. But um, Nigeria passed some legislation. Now, this is the funny part. I believe the legislation took 17 years to get through their government. So it's kind of a long wow. legislative, yeah, long legislative cycle. It was either 17 or 21. I want to say it was ridiculously long. But but as stringent as it can get in in their legal world um per, specifically f- forbidding and making it illegal for the government to seize private assets now big caveat here right anytime we're talking about a country like nigeria if some other party were to come in and take over or there was a coup right that that law means less than the paper it's written on so i mean you got to take a you know take that with a giant grain of salt but um, I think you're going to start seeing that. It's the only thing that makes sense. I think a lot of these other, um, especially in Africa, and, and I'm careful to forecast this because there have been too many fake dawns uh, or false dawns in Africa. But a, the the overreach of so many of these Western governments now, um, it doesn't take a genius if you're in one of those natural resource rich countries that has traditionally not managed their stuff very well to open up and say, hey. Um, you might be the bad guy in your country, but come to ours. And, um, I actually think that, you know, people have talked about the next hundred years being the Chinese century. I think that's laughable. I think it's much more likely it's an African century. Um, we can all hope now, again, there've been a lot of false dawns before, and I could, this could certainly be another one. Um, but you know, when you start seeing countries, that just seems like a classic sea shift to me, a sea change. You start seeing countries like Nigeria putting in legislation that protects private parties, while Western democracies, typically the bastion of, you know, or, or the birthplace of free market capitalism, are moving in exactly the opposite direction. 
Um, it's kind of one of those things where I look around and I'm like, boy, I really, I really hope we don't get what we're asking for because, um, you know, th there will be significant pain if we continue down these courses, L like you and I were talking about again, offline, less so here in the United States, because despite our stupidity, we, we are so rich in natural resources, but that ain't the case in Europe. And I think Europe's up against it for years to come. Also, to add to your points there, South America, Latin America, they're heading the wrong direction for natural yep. resources, too. I mean, the tax policy, you're seeing permits for copper mines taken away in Chile. You're seeing new taxes when uh, a year ago when copper hit around $5 a pound. You saw Panama, Chile, a uh, number of different other countries talk about puni very punitive uh, copper royalty taxes added on. So these policies and then socialist politicians are getting elected, either banning mining entirely. So these are all going to create over the next couple of years, maybe not in six months with commodities futures contracts getting smashed, especially the manipulation of the oil market and the comments from the Saudi oil minister about uh, U.S. futures contracts being manipulated for the oil market, which I was pretty shocked to uh, hear them publicly. No kidding. But um, if they're going to make it very difficult to bring a mine online with permits and costs and punitive taxes, I mean, these are all going to create even worse supply side problems in the years to come. What did they What did they say? I didn't hear the comments, or maybe I did read them. What, what did the Saudi oil minister say what, exactly? He sounded like a gold and silver investor who reads the did, Gold did Antitrust Action Committee newsletters. <laughs> what, what, so, so when you look at it and, and – he was, Again, he was talking wanna... about physical markets. He was talking about the physical market for oil and supply being tight. And just in the last two weeks, Zach, we had Iranian crude oil selling at over $10 a barrel premium to the futures contract price. So you have the spot markets, which when I speak to oil fund managers like Cuppy or Josh Young, people specialize in this stuff, and they tell me they speak to oil traders talking about the tightness of the physical oil market. And then I hear other people telling me the oil futures contracts are being manipulated like they've never been manipulated before. It sounds a lot like what's been going on, the games in gold and silver. So that's, to summarize, that's what the uh, Saudi oil minister said. He said the physical market for oil is very tight. We're not going to think about really increasing supply that much. In fact, they were talking about cutting because of the paper gains going on in U.S. oil futures contracts. Yeah. So what, so I, again, I've been, in, I've been managing money long enough to know that, or, or I've never made any money on the conspiratorial suppression of an asset, right? Like we, I've heard that story so many times and like, I think it's really foolish to think that it doesn't happen. Um, I, you know, you know that it does. Um, having said that, I look at the global oil market and it's just so big. I don't, how would you even go about doing that? I mean, w w would it be central banks? I, I don't even, like I said, I, this could be ridiculous me even saying this, but would, would they just be printing money and selling contracts into the market? I mean, how, I, I just don't understand how you do it. Like mechanically, yeah. do you even know how to go about doing that? Yeah, it just sounds like they've overwhelmed the amount of open interest for futures contracts and how many of them are net short. So there's just, it sounds like there's a lot of just um, programmed high frequency trading selling at uh, very illiquid trading hours. So it just comes in and there's enormous selling pressure. I The people in gold and silver market have called it not for profit. I mean, this will prevent though new supply from coming online. So if you're a right. marginal oil and natural gas producer, you're going to say, hey, there's too much volatility in the oil price. I can't hedge at a higher price. I'm not going to bring as much new supply online. It's just cheaper to go and uh, either increase my dividends because we have free cash flow now or do share buybacks because my shares are cheap because oil uh, the, the oil futures contract is temporarily down or it's just cheaper to go and buy cash flow. You can do mergers and acquisitions instead. You can yeah, buy well yeah. Well, it, 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 yeah, I've sat there a hundred times and just sit there and go, man, if I had a pile of dough, I mean, screw the stocks. I'd be in there picking these things private and just, and just siphoning off the cash flow. I mean, it's so ridiculous. Um, I think then Warren on the, Buffett, I think Warren Buffett's about to do that with <laughs> Occidental Petroleum. It sure looks like it. He's setting I, up the steps for it. I mean, you, you look at the, yeah, you look at the 
cash flow potential. And I mean, that thing has the potential. I mean, Apple's a big cash flow for them too, but it, they, they don't own the cash flows, right? They're still just shareholders. But you look at that, I mean, that could be the second act for Berkshire. Like that could be the version of their Geico. You know what I mean? In terms of the cash flows that could su- supply to the business. Um, but when you, when you look in and here's the big difference to me that I think about the, the gold and silver markets. And and by the way, you know, I was one of those guys thinking they were manipulated too. They were, they, they've admitted to it. Like these guys, some of these guys have been brought up on charges. Now I, I'm not going to hold my breath and wait for really onerous sentences to be thrown against them because that's not the way these things work. Um, but the difference between the two is that you can suppress the price of oil and silver all the time, and it's not going to result in people not being able to feed their families and turn on their lights, right? So you've made a, you made a point that I think is really key. For those people out there that are worried that they've got their thumb on oil and natural gas and they're in control, they're not. Because the longer they, quote unquote, win the price war and suppress the price, the worse the back end of the problem becomes because all it's doing is preventing future investment and present investment. And well, every day we prolong investment, we are just backloading the problem. But natural gas is not suppressed. I mean, the U.S. natural gas price, we're near all-time highs. We're, we went from around two-ish in early 2020 to uh, over nine when we're recording this interview here right now. So, And then the LNG prices in Asia, the European Union are even higher than that. Well, yeah, and that to me is just a function of that getting that 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 to me is a function of just a a, com, a completely dislocated, ridiculous market. Meaning, if you look at the spread, I, I don't really think that's indicative of U.S. natural gas demand at all. I don't think U.S. natural gas demand is all of a sudden quadrupled post COVID. I, I think that you had a ton of that production taken offline with the shale getting bushwhacked again for the second time in eight years. And then the other aspect of it is. We, just look at, I mean, you and I both know when we see jaws, right? When we see, when we see us nat gas clear down here and European nat gas clear up here on the chart, right? That's where you get the jaws. What happens with alligator jaws? 100% of the time they close, right? So I mean, that to me is a completely dysfunctional broken market. I mean, how can a commodity like natural gas be trading for nine? What, what is the, what is, there's so many different ways to measure it, but whatever, nine here. And what is it trading at the equivalent of like 40 or 50 in Europe right now? Well, it's, it's not, um, it's because of bad policy culmination right. of decades. When you have drilling bans throughout the European Union, and there's only really oil and natural gas drilling in a couple places, either in Norway or the North Sea, and most of the other locations in the European Union, basically everywhere onshore is banned. I mean, this is going to, and they have to import all their energy and then they're shutting off nuclear power plants. This stuff's going to happen. So this is not necessarily because of free markets and capitalism. This is because of bad policy just compounding on each other over the years. And then you get a dislocation like this. Oh, no, I'm with you 100%. And and, and I'm not blaming it on capitalism at all. I'm saying it's a dysfunctional market because of government interference and government doing completely economically irrational things. Like, you know, you're sitting there and identifying. And, and the funny thing is, is, two consecutive U.S. presidents warned the EU about this exact same thing, right? You all identify Vladimir Putin as a, as a thug and a, and a danger, but you're going to marry yourself to his production and become literally, you know, not literally, they get a little bit elsewhere, but functionally 100% reliant on a guy that you think is a thug and a, and a cretin. Um, it, it makes absolutely no sense. But what I'm saying is that's not a natural market because you know, it's so many of these things today get blamed on capitalism. My answer is always, guys, that's an outcome of the lack of capitalism, not capitalism. Yeah, I agree. Right? Um, and that to me is the European situation, right? If free markets were allowed to prevail, no rational actor would have done the energy policy that they did and then tied themselves. I mean, it was just an idiotic political move, if nothing else. I mean, why in the world would you – you basically handed Putin the keys to your manufacturing capability, right? Like Germany, they they just they handed Putin the keys to their whole manufacturing sector, um, and and he controls it. So I, you know, and then you shut down nuclear power plants so that you have even <laughs> less options for sources for cheap electricity. Un unbelievable! It, 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 these people are just gluttons for pain, and I I think that this is what happens. You know, as I've I've had Doomberg on the show multiple times, and and. You know, I like his jokes is, you know, when, whenever physics and ideology come head to head, physics is undefeated. Um, <laughs> and, and it's so true because, you, you know, all of your woke ideology and all of your green, like at the end of the day, guys, lights either turn on and heat comes through the vents or it doesn't. 
And this is a very binary outcome. And so you either invest in energy at an appropriate level or you're going to pay the fiddler. And, you know, that's where we're at. And so I, I look at I look at this situation with that gas. And um, I think that what you're going to see is what should have been happening over the last decade, which it should be much more of a global market. Uh, we need to invest in LNG terminals. We need to invest a lot more in LNG uh, uh, vessels. Um, it, that that is going to raise the price over the course of the year. And and I also think, Jason, this is a perfect example of what's happening with globalization, right? Um, globalization was sourcing internationally everything you needed at the push of a button and having virtually zero fear in a disruption of that relationship, right? Well, now all of a sudden, those relationships all around the world have changed and they become more competitive. So what does that mean? That means that the price of all these goods needs to go higher because the price of that good going along with Austrian economics, the price of that good needs to not only embody the cost to produce it, but it also has to embody the uncertainty that may exist around the, the scarcity of that asset, right? Like a market price at any given moment should be pricing in all available information. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that the price of nat gas was so suppressed for so long, because again, it was a, it was a manufacturer, it was, it was a market that was being so impacted by political miscalculations and politics in general and wrongheadedness and all these other different things. So, you know, to me, I just look at it and go, yeah, you've got, we, we, you cannot trust Russia. You cannot trust these neighbors that you were able to trust for decades at a time. So that needs to be built into the cost of energy. And I think that if people think this is a blip and that we're going to quote unquote, go back to normal, I think it's much more likely that this is closer to a new normal. And in fact, I see continued pressure on those prices because you got to get a policy shift first. And then you and I both know when it comes to energy, nat you know, specifically natural gas and oil, the policy shift is just the beginning. Right then, you're probably best case scenario three to four years out until you actually see that production come online at a, at a meaningful level. Um, and you know, a liquefied and, and a liquefied to add your points there, a liquefied. Sorry to interrupt. The liquefied no, natural fine. gas terminal is even more expensive because the permitting process, the cost, the cost of production, the years. I mean, you could be looking at six, seven, eight years and many billions of dollars to bring a large liquefied natural gas export terminal or import terminal online. So these things are not cheap, and it takes years of planning. Yeah. And, th and that to me is that, that to me is the biggest failure because I just look at this whole thing and I am not a, I'm, I am not a sky is falling type person. I don't think you can last in this, in, 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 in this business if you are. Um, but you just look at it for the, you know, the idea that this is a short blip, it's just not going to be, this is going to be dealt with for years and it's going to be a problem for years. And the analogy or the story we've been telling our clients is Hey guys, we think you're. I, we think the quote unquote energy crisis is going to be a series of rolling crises um, that will vary in intensity and and length, and it'll be kind of like playing whack a mole. You know, you'll address this one over here. You know, like our first bout. You know, you have coordinated. You know, you look at what the world has done. They've basically just tried to reduplicate central bank policy into energy policy, right? They just rather than doing coordinated, you know, quantitative easing, they're doing a coordinated SPR release. Well, again, the problem with that thinking is oil, unlike currency, you can't just push a button and print it. So, you know, their ability, what, what, and what is the, what is the, what, what is the amount, Jason? Are you familiar with the amount of the SPR right now? Like, I, I, weren't we like targeting like 2 million barrels a day, but, but we were also working in concert with several other countries. What, what was that total? Do you know? Uh, I don't know offhand. I know we're at what 30 or 40 year lows, lowest since 1985. So yeah. it's, it's down a lot. It's going to take many years to refill. But other countries, this is an important point you brought up. I mean, India and I think Japan and other countries, South Korea, I think too, and other countries were also dumping their SPR oil. So there was a, a lot of attempts since November. I was covering this on short videos for listeners. There's been about three, four, five attempts where there was like coordinated press releases from these governments announcing they were dumping strategic petroleum reserve oil, hoping to crash the oil price. But again, this is just going to prevent new supply and investment from coming online. OPEC and the Saudis have basically said that. The oil company executives here in the United States, if you look at the numbers, they're not really spending tons of money on drilling. They're, most of their capital investment is into what? Dividend increases, share buybacks, they're focusing on free cash flow being efficient and then mergers and acquisitions because if they spend a lot on drilling, I mean, in, in this administration with the politicians and bureaucrats, you're vilified. Well, not only are you vilified, 
but from a guy that, again, is a value guy, I've been involved in energy, especially post 2014, the crash when tried to do, went through there and picked through the rubble and had a couple decent plays, but nothing to write home about. Um, but it's been something we've been watching for a long time, right? You and I were talking about nat gas earlier, like just thinking, okay, nat gas is not worth zero, right? At some point, it's gonna it's it's gonna find its footing, um, you know. But looking through, looking at all of those scenarios, trying to find, you know, good values. Um, one of the things you realize going around, and I'm talking going to conferences, being around different investors, if you're a U.S. producer and you want to see shareholders call for your head and you want to see your price, the price of your stock cut by 25% in a single day, go out there and tell them you're starting a shale drilling program, right? <laughs> That's all you have to do. And you're going to get smoked. People go, well, why is that? You go, because it's crashed twice in the last eight years. And when you've got oil at 86 a barrel and the break-even cost in shale is somewhere between 80 to 90 right now, who wants to go invest in that, right? I mean, they... Yeah, we'd like to go help the market get oversupplied so we can get our scalps taken again. I mean, it, it's insanity. And, um, you know, I I just think that this is – there's also another interesting thing going on with this, and, I, and I'm sure you can go off on this as well. But to that note, I read a, I read a CNBC article today that literally, literally had me laughing out loud to the point where a couple of employees came into my office and were like, what's going on? Um, it was the CNBC article where they're interviewing a quote unquote energy an analyst from some bank. I, I forget what name it was. It wasn't one of the big guys, but I'd, I'd seen the name before. Um, and they asked him to explain what was going on in the price of oil and why it was dropping. And he said, yeah, oil weakness is probably going to persist because uh, uh, demand in, in the Western world is stagnant. And uh, that's also corresponding with a boom in U.S. shale oil. And I went, a boom in U.S. shale oil. So literally, it caught me so off guard that I scrolled to the top of the article to check the date. A boom. So this guy is an energy analyst at a bank, and he thinks that one of the things pushing the price of oil down is a boom in U.S. shale. Um, I have never seen a market where supposedly people that are paid to know and are supposed to know Right. And, 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 and me saying that it's not a boom in U.S. shale, that is not a subjective statement. We, there, there is no way you can twist or contort what is currently happening in, in the domestic oil production world, specifically the shale fields, that this is a boom. I, it's not even close. And I just I don't have an answer to this, but I've also we're at this weird place culturally where it seems like facts have become ethereal. And, you know, like had I gone back and forth with that analyst, it kind of been one of those things kind of reminds me of the big Lebowski, you know, he looked at me and said, well, man, that's like your opinion. And I'm like, no, it's not my opinion. We can look at rig counts. We can look at head counts of the amount of people working in the shale oil, shale fields, and we can compare it to 2018 and 2014. Um, I mean, are you aware of any analysis of the data that can get you to say that there's a boom currently in U.S. shale production? No, I think a lot of these shell fields, except for the Permian, um, the stuff I've read, a lot of them basically peaked. Uh, they peaked in 2019. They would require enormous amounts of investment to restart production growth again, like substantial production growth again. So a lot of these shell fields in the United States, and there are more shale fields that can be drilled, but a lot of them, like the Haynesville uh, in Dallas, Texas, I believe, and some others, those ones have already peaked. Well, yeah, and I was reading, I was reading um, a great, Oh, what was the name of the company? I'm blanking out now. I, I should have come well, in with some notes. Well, I wouldn't be, let me add one more point. I wouldn't be surprised if the CNBC, CNBC producer sent out like a mass email asking, are there any oil or energy analysts out there that have any type of argument for why oil is going to crash? I would not be shocked if they like sent out like a mass email like that. And they brought on like random dude with any type of argument whatsoever who can uh, raise some type of argument why oil would crash. I would not be shocked. Wait, because, are um, you... Are you questioning the ju journalistic integrity of CNBC? Well, that's uh, – <laughs> well, what's – most people aren't aware of this, and I know one of the guys, that's actually how Zero Hedge started was from like anonymous assistant producers from CNBC and Bloomberg News that they were tired of having their stories killed, and that's how the oh, Zero really? Hedge started. Yes. 
Oh, I was yep. not aware of that. Yeah, so Tyler Durden was a pen name that all the assistant producers at CNBC, not all of them, but a good amount of them at CNBC and Bloomberg News, they were anonymously like writing articles there on the Zero Hedge blog. So, Oh, wow. I was unaware of that. That's fascinating. So, mm -hmm. so, oh, so to the point that I was making about listening to the, 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 the uh, interview or the minutes of a conference call, was it a conference call or was it an interview? It might have been an interview of a... Um, Pretty prominent. Again, I'm just blanking on the company name, but he, he ran an energy company based out of Houston. Most of them are. Um, and he was saying that, look, he, he goes, there's still stuff that we can pull out of shale, but he goes, I think people's, people are forgetting. Why did we crash in 2014? Why did we crash again in COVID? He goes, COVID's a little different story. He goes, we, he goes, the vast majority of these fields were never as productive or profitable as we thought. Uh, the well lives were never as good as we thought. And he goes, yeah, you can get oil out of them. But he goes, all the numbers that people are using, those are way gone. We've realized they're way off. The price point, the life of these wells is much shorter than we thought they'd be. Uh, the the cost to maintain the wells, the 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 lifetime of the well is much shorter. Uh, you know, all these different things, all the economics were significantly worse, um, you know, which essentially led to the shale bust in 2014. Um, you know, they were trying to, they were trying to, to fix a negative cash flow. Uh, you know, they were trying to come up with negative cash flow and trying to fix it with, you know, uh, what is the old adage, right? Trying to fix a negative cash flow problem by selling more or, or whatever the way the old adage goes, but um, make it up on volume. Yeah. Make it up on volume. There you go. And, and, you know, we all know what that, that all ends up in sector bankruptcy and that's what happened. But, but one of the whole reasons is the economics behind it. You know, the old adage that the, that the, the, the you know, we worked off this number for years that the break even cost for shale is 60. It wasn't 60. It, th there were places where it was, but it wasn't 60. Now you go post COVID, you factor in increased cost of labor. You do all this stuff. Um, you know, I've, I listened to some really credible people who crunch numbers on our own. We think conservatively that number is 80 to 90 and probably higher than that in many of those fields. Drilling so, costs are rising too. Yeah, I mean, you, the, all of it is going up. So where, where and, and this is the big part for those of those people out there that are worried about an oil collapse. Now, oil is insane. I mean, just go pull up, you know, it, it can move a lot. But in terms of sustainable oil prices, if you're out there worried about an oil price collapse, don't be. There isn't enough cheap oil out there. And one of the ways that you know is if you're even close to that break-even level, let's call it 80. Okay. When you look at the carnage, and I think it's higher all in than 80, especially now, but when you look at the carnage in 2014, you're currently at 86. How many of you want to invest in, in, in a project that is going to bring serious amounts of supply online when your break even cost is 80 and current spot price is 86? Who, who wants to do that? No right? one's going to do it unless it's no. someone else's money. It's like, unless it's like government sponsored program or something like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'd no like to see them. I'd like to see them pass that. Right. I mean, that government ain't get a step up, not, not this administration, but like you said, let's get a room full of a million investors or, you know, that's a big room, but I mean, you know, whatever, ask how many people want to do that. When do people invest? They invest when they think that the, that the price is sustainable at much higher levels for a very extended period of time. And this is why I look at what we're doing in energy policy, and it's very frustrating at times um, as an investor and as a citizen, right? As a citizen, you want to see them have rational energy policy. As an investor, my job is to capitalize on these things to keep my clients safe and, and make them money. So, but it's frustrating on both sides. As an investor, you kind of sit back and go, well, okay, you know, it's, it's really stupid to watch, you know, the price of these companies swing the way they are. Um, because you know, people, well, cause oil is dropping and you go, well, 60% of their revenue comes from natural gas and their oil is hedged at 90. So you've bid the price of the stock down by 45% and this 20% pullback in the price of oil is going to be about a 2% hit to their net earnings this year, right? It's not going to do and, anything. Yeah. And the oil company has a variable dividend policy. They're paying out 20, 30% of their free cash flow. And what a lot of people miss, they're talking about oil and an oil crash. They're not bringing up how good natural gas is holding up. And yeah, yeah. So yeah, natural, the, the winning portion here, I see like long-term, I'm way more bullish natural gas long-term because of cheap electricity and all the new usages for natural great. gas. 
um, fertilizer, many other things. I think natural gas has a very bright future long term unless there's a type of new energy and then that's going to take decades to adopt. So if they do have some type of breakthrough with fusion, nuclear fusion, that's still going to take decades for the rest of the world to adopt it. Yeah, no. And, 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 you know, as far as, you know, despite, you know, it's still a fossil fuel. Look, like I tell people, I go, look, if you're that concerned about nat gas, go do a trick, go into your house, into your kitchen, turn on all five of your burners and let those suckers run for a day. Okay. And then go in there and test the air quality in your home and tell me if it's really noticeable. It's not. Now I'm not encouraging everybody to stop airflow through their house and kill themselves from, but my point is, Right. If you can sit there now, is it perfect? No, but as a transition fuel, it's insane. You know, the, the and that's one of the re, that's one of the things that ticks me off about this whole energy debate. If you were really serious, if the goal was zero emissions, you'd be going about it in a completely different way. This is insanity. You would understand the need that that, or you'd understand the dynamic of perfection being the enemy enemy of progress. Cool. You would you would absolutely, to your point, you would have to any rational human being would see natural gas is natural gas and nuclear as being the transition fuels nuclear probably needing to have a permanent place um there's just so many different things you would do you know it's kind of like watching the whole covid debacle you're like this doesn't even make sense on the face of it um so you know on the on the natural gas side i agree with you i am extremely bullish long term um i think it is way underutilized i think the markets are way out of whack because of government interference and I think there's going to be a lot of profit to be made on, on the investing side. The other thing that's really interesting is something interesting has happened over the last 15 years. And if you look at the economics of the last 15 years, it makes sense. When you look at these companies' valuations and you start breaking them down almost universally, now there's always a couple of exceptions, but almost universally, any nat gas asset is basically counted. Again, if you're doing the valuation, there are several companies we own where they're trading at a massive discount to their oil production and their oil assets, and they're getting absolutely zero credit for their natural gas assets. Which it's makes insane. no sense. Yeah, it makes no sense because natural gas seems to be the star performer, the star commodity that the rest of the world needs. I mean, they're shortage it, the, the natural gas that was supposed to go to emerging markets, localified natural gas shipments, it's going to the European Union. It's going to the United Kingdom instead. So there's a lack of natural gas globally. Then you have countries like Australia. I think they just banned a sizable chunk of their liquefied natural gas. Justin Trudeau does not want a liquefied natural gas export facility built in Canada, even though they have a ton of it and could literally mint money if they did. Yeah. I, and and here's here's the part of it that on a political basis is the most confusing to me. And then, and then I'd like to get back to the company specific side of it, because I think that's where the real interesting opportunity is. But one of the most frustrating things about this whole situation to me is <clears throat> if, if the Western world, so Europe, us, Canada, if we are 100% successful on the most optimistic projections about our carbon emissions, it will have somewhere around a zero impact on current emission levels globally because we've already reduced our emissions so much. If you were serious about – if your goal again was to lower global emissions – and remember, remember, people, this is a global problem, right? It's not like the United States can adopt the right energy policy and we won't be impacted by quote-unquote climate change, right? <laughs> if, if you're pumping it in Tahiti – Right. It's affecting whether, you know, again, the way the science goes. And I'm not trying to get in a big climate debate here, but I'm well, just saying. The, the, go yeah, ahead. The main, the main polluter is China. Okay. So right. China, and, is, and China has ran coal. They they built a new coal-fired power plant each week for decades. Oh, so yeah. The main, the main polluter of all this um, is China. And China no longer has cheap labor. The labor costs are up enormously. And their electricity costs in for manufacturing facilities in China are insanely higher their german levels are higher than they were three four five years ago uh, i've seen videos with chinese factory owners saying their electricity costs are up 10x oh yeah well and that and that's why i think that you know and, and there's people that'll call me a conspiracy theorist when i say this and maybe i am but when i look at the current quote unquote covid lockdowns in china they don't fly it, there's something that just doesn't smell right about it a i understand the problem that they've got with their vaccines 
Um, and I think that plays into it. The other part of it is I think it's a convenience issue. I, I think it's, I, it's, I, I, let me put it this way. It's a bridge too far for me to believe in a world where energy prices have done what they have done and the dollar index is at 110, that that just so happens to coincide with a time where the CCP finds it politically expedient to lock down cities of 20 million plus, right? I, I just are, are you in the camp where like they're intentionally trying to destroy commodities demand for energy, food, base metals? Are you in that camp then? I am in a quasi camp. I I I I have learned the hard way that it's I, I try to avoid whenever I can the silver bullet argument just because it's so rarely one thing. Um I find it beyond uh the pale of reasonable thought to think that the suppression of commodity prices isn't at least part of the reason why they're locking down. I, we're talking about the CCP here, right? So, right, this is the same political party that starved out 40 million of their people for political expediency. I, I, when you have 300 people die in a city like Shanghai, I, I just, I, looking at the Chinese government, I just cannot wrap my head around that making Xi Jinping go, okay, we are going to purposefully torpedo our entire economy and we're going to risk upheaval because we can't spare three to 400 COVID deaths. I just, I, there, and, and, you know, honestly, the more data we get out about it, maybe there's worse strains in China. I, I just think that that just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, doesn't pass the fly, the smell test. I think if you add that with commodities, because you and I both know, I mean, bottom line, what if, if China has a, an Achilles heel, if they have two Achilles heels, what is it? A, the inflow of dollars. It's the only way they can keep their real estate bubble going, which is effectively their entire nation's store of wealth, wealth in quotation marks. Um, and then B, the fact that they're that they're not even close to being an you know they're a massive energy importer to a massive and food. level, yeah, food, right, too. and food. So w if you're a, if you're a repressive regime like the CCP, and you look back historically, what is the thing that often ends up in you losing power the quickest and the most violently? It is rapidly rising inflation, food costs, energy costs, right? That's what gets the people rallying in the streets. So. Yeah, I I mean what if if I am and I think you have to and I'm not an expert on Chinese politics but I I think you look at it and you sit back culturally and you're looking at them sitting there going okay the dollars are stopping we are no longer you know the veneer of Chinese superiority or whatever has been deeply damaged the world does not view China the same way they do post covid as they did pre covid Oh yeah, uh, they're going through a big bust. Yeah, well, I mean, I you know, I don't think guys like me and you have changed our opinion about China after COVID. Well, well, now they have falling real estate prices, so now their banks are in trouble. They're printing money to save their banks. They're going through very similar policies to what the Federal Reserve Bank did two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. So China's going through that, and their technology companies are also collapsing too. So right, but they don't have the rules. But they don't have the world's reserve currency, and they're not, and they do not have their own source of uh, uh, food production sufficient enough to feed their population, and they they are massively energy importers. So if you're the if you're the CCP, I I and again you look at things the way that they do, right? You you don't look at your citizens the same way we do here in the United States. You know, you see, I I just I I think it's ridiculous to think. That the commodity situation does not have a significant role in these lockdowns, and 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 especially coming out of COVID, because we, what did the world find out that if you want to if you want to massively overnight, you know, just what do you you know take out by the knees, right? Your your demand for commodities, do lockdowns, right? That's that's what you saw, and so I remember coming into this at the end of last year. And I was saying, look, I think that one of the only one of the only um, dangers to our bull thesis on uh, on energy are governments doing quote unquote COVID induced lockdowns. Um, and I I I just think it's beyond the pale. I don't think it's the only reason. I don't think that it, I think it's very seldom that that especially on issues that are that large in a country that large that it's a single issue decision. But to think it doesn't play a part, I just I don't understand that argument, right? I don't I don't think it's the whole thing, but um, <laughs> I just I just don't understand how that wouldn't play into their calculus. 
So I have a couple more questions here. We're around an hour before we wrap up the interview. Do you think that oil stocks are the cheapest risk reward right now? Or are there other commodities or countries or sectors you think that might offer on the long side good risk reward? Or is there really not very much at all that's good risk reward on the long side with potentially undervaluation and potentially even decent growth going forward? Mm. Um, so l- let me let me let me clarify this a little bit or, or set this up just a touch. I think that we need to separate. <laughs> sounds funny to even say it. I think we need to do a little bit of a separation between financial performance and stock performance. It is for as, as far as stock price performance goes. I I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I you know. I have seen so many things in the last three years that I, you know, as crazy as this whole decade has been, I've seen things in the last three years, even things right now that just absolutely bake my brain. Um, you know, companies like Tesla being, you know, a perfect example. And 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 well, the funny thing is Tesla looks like a rationally priced security compared to a lot of things out there today. So, so I think, you know, I, I would like, I don't think that these will be unvolatile. But when I look at energy prices in general and getting back to our point, I, I think it's a little bit tougher to play it. I think that gas is even that, you know, significantly more so undervalued. But if you look at them as a sector in with the current backdrop being what it is, I've been managing a portfolio, actively managing a portfolio for 15 years. I have never in my career seen a group or a sector of companies that we're trading it so far below intrinsic value, no matter how you ran the equations. The only caveat I would throw at that is I have seen similarly priced securities, but when you pop the hood on them, you know, they were trading at two times earnings with no debt on the balance sheet and cash flowing 30% of their market cap, but their revenues were shrinking by 20% a year. Right. There there was always a catch. So no growth. Yeah. Right. No growth or negative growth, melting ice cube type scenarios. GameStop was actually it, it, not not quite that frothy, but it was one of the reasons that we were watching GameStop clear back in 2015. And that's one of the parts of the GameStop story that I don't think really has gotten told. When GameStop was at five to ten dollars a share, even even with the troubles it was looking, it was an extraordinarily cheap company. Now it was a melting ice cube. But it was incredibly cheap. And what I mean by cheap is if you found a way to stabilize their their revenues, right, and stop the bleeding, the company would instantly go up one and a half to two times, right? Yeah. Just it was trading that. When you flip over and you look at the energy stocks, um, it's it's insane. I mean, we've got companies that have zero. There's one in in particular. It's actually the one with those Nigerian holdings. It's one of the reasons we were able to take that. We were we were willing to stomach the political risk. They've got zero debt about $450 million of cash on the balance sheet. This year alone, they will do about $500 million in free cash flow. Um, and they are a mixed producer throwing off nat gas and oil. And so, so $400 million of cash on the balance sheet, no debt. They'll do $500 million in free cash flow this year, and they're trading at $940 million market cap. So you're basically buying the company for, for the cash on hand in this year's free ca- net cash flow, and you're getting all the assets for free. I've never seen that before. Um, do, you think, do you think this is why value investors like David Einhorn, who would normally not buy resource companies, energy companies, are starting to buy big positions in natural gas producers, pipeline companies? Do you think because of what you talked about with the fundamentals? You have to. Yeah, meaning, meaning, um, and and I've actually warned our clients about this. I said, listen, guys, I am not buying the things that I think are going to be the easiest to hold right now, but it's to a point where I can't justify allocating capital to anything else. That's how cheap they are. And it just, regardless of what you think about the underlying commodity, you get back to this dynamic that Buffett talks about all the time, which is there are no bad assets. There's just bad prices. Meaning when the price of anything gets low enough, you just have to plug your nose and buy it. I don't think you can consider yourself a value investor if you're not backing up the truck on this stuff. It kind of reminds me of Top Gun, where he's, you know, they're in the dogfight and he goes, I don't like it. And he goes, What do you mean? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't get better than this. If you're not buying energy companies right now, you're not a value investor. You're just not. Um, it, it, I, well, I, I mean, you, didn't how, Seth many, how many, how many times in your career have you seen companies with pristine balance sheets, zero debt, so zero liabilities? With half of their market cap sitting in cash, cash flowing 40 to 50% of their market cap per year, right? 
and and trading at uh, two times earnings. And well, and the, and oh by the way, revenue's up 145 percent year over year. Yes, I mean but the the problem though is um, if you just looked at the company and said it wasn't in in uh, energy and wasn't a commodity company, you have a school of value investors like the Seth Klarman School where they wrote like an entire chapter in margin of safety saying, don't buy mining companies, don't buy resource companies because of the CapEx problems. But if they're making this much free cash flow, and then you have the government saying, you can't bring on new supply or making it almost very, very difficult to bring on new supply, then you're gonna have high profit margins and free cash flow. I, yeah, and I and I think guys like Klarman uh, I think he was 100% correct. I think that if we had Klarman Car- uh, on here with us right now, I think he'd also say, well, hold on. A lot of these guys have changed their practices. Now, why did they do it? They did it because everybody went on a buyer strike and nobody would buy their stock. It didn't matter what they were doing. People were tired of them incinerating capital. Um, it, furthermore, you go into the mining sectors. Um, you know, Again, I grew up in the industry. I mean, you want to talk about – and if you don't believe me, if you're one of those like diehard goal- – I had a joke. Brent Johnson was has been on the show several times, Santiago Capital on Twitter. And he started out in the inju- industry at Goldbug. I started out in the industry, you know, I was raised in the industry. If you want to see unbelievable amounts of capital get incinerated for no reason, go back to mining companies circa 2004 to 2007. I mean, it 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 <laughs> it'd make even the tightest, you know, even the most ex- or, or from two, Zach or from like 2008 to 20, yeah. 2015, I think Barrick Gold and a bunch of the other larger gold miners, they wrote off almost 70 billion in bad deals. It was pretty nuts. <laughs> oh, it's insane. Well, especially when you put into context how big the industry is, 70 billion, you're talking about what are, I mean, that's that's probably the equivalent of like five to 7% of the entire market cap of the entire sector. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's a, it was huge... more, I think it was 30 or 40. The, it was okay, 30 enormous, or 40%. Yeah. yeah it was some over ridiculous. 25, they wrote off over 25% of the entire market cap and valuations and Barrick deal. Barrick gold, I think bought a copper mine at the top of the copper market for seven or 8 billion, wrote the entire thing off, sold it. And that was many years ago. So obviously copper, there are shortages and stuff like that, but it was just bad timing. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think Carmen would come back to you and he would say, again, we, you know, an add-on to what what I said previously, would he'd come back and say, look, at, at a certain point, uh, again, it goes back to what Buffett says. There's no such thing as bad assets, bad, bad prices. If you can get it cheap enough, you know, when you're buying the thing, <laughs> when you're buying the thing at cash and this year's cash flow with no debt, um, you can stomach some bad capital allocation. Right. I mean, there, there's there's a pretty big margin of safety there. And that's why I was, you know, I'm very familiar with Carmen's work. I agree wholeheartedly with it. I have experienced and seen it firsthand. These I don't know what it is about the mining sector specifically, but every time they get in a bull market, they act as if it will never stop. Every time they get in a bear market, they act as if it will never stop. Um a lot of these guys make exactly the wrong moves. But I think that, you know, if you want to go into the gold mining sector, I think the emergence and success at Franco, Nevada has changed some of the uh, behaviors in the industry. Um, I think there's some other good operators and smaller and mid cap operations that came in and brought much more rigid capital controls and much more disciplined <clears throat> allocations of capital that have cleaned things up. I think they've kind of sort of been the rising tide that's lifted the, you know, the the level of the industry, the sophistication of the industry. And then I think, you know, a decade of hard times does a lot too. Um, one of the things I talked about, you know, clear back in 2010, 2012 was when you went into the mining industry, it was like stepping back in time, specifically in the gold, uh, on the gold side of it. They were remarkably behind in terms of the way they utilized technology, just the way they did things. It was just, they were kind of operating, you know, it was, it was probably all the holdovers from the, from the bull run from the late nineties, you know, and, and these guys were just behind the times. Um, You've just seen a big change there and you can see it in their, you know, you can see it in their income statements. You can see it in their balance sheets. I mean, just go, go, go pull up like XLE, right. And go run down the list of those companies and go look at their leverage ratios and their balance sheets and compare it to five years ago. I mean, that will tell you the story, right? Um, GDX, go do the same thing. Go compare the balance sheets and the and the uh, uh, leverage and, you know, all that kind of, go compare all of that to where those companies were in 2014. It's night and day difference. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's sort of like, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, gets into, 
you know, would I like to own a lot of these tech companies? No, a lot of these valuations. I think it's insanity. And I think a lot of them are throwing capital away too and doing, you know, it's just what industries do in bull markets. They get stupid. And these mining companies and these oil companies will probably get stupid again. And when we see that happen, that'll be the time to sell. But God, if these, I mean, you know, I would just encourage some of you out there that can read financial statements and, uh, and I'd continue to, I'd, I'd encourage you to continue to listen to guys like Jason, cause you're not going to get this information elsewhere and he's pretty sharp, but just go look at the balance sheets yourself. Go look at the cash flow statements, go look at them as businesses and not stocks and do a little game that we've done here. Try to synthesize a scenario with a lot of these companies where on a financial basis, they don't have handsome returns going forward. I mean, you basically would have to be forecasting a global Great Depression. Uh, that's really just a complete collapse in demand, like oil at 35 and NatCast going back to three. You're right. Well, I mean, even even if we have a Great Depression, I mean, there's still going to be a basic baseline case for usage of commodities for food, electricity, um, people using diesel or well, the baseline gasoline. Case, Jason, the baseline hmm. case would increase, right? Because of the price, all those commodities get hammered. And you've got an economy that's dying. That'll be an economy that cares a lot less about carbon emissions and will reach for the cheap source of oil. And that's what I'm saying. No matter how you roll this dice, it keeps coming up with the same number, right? Which is if that scenario plays out, we're talking about negative investment and a lack of investment currently. What would happen if you had a depression and the price of oil got back down to 35? I, I, I mean, think about it. I mean, it, that, that's what I'm saying is, this, this problem has existed for long enough and the misallocation of capital, in my opinion, is endured for long enough that you're sort of at this point of no return, which is no matter, it's kind of like choose your own ending. You know, those stories back in the day, choose your own, choose your own ending. Uh, you can choose your own ending, but it's still, you're still going to end up on the last page. And the last page is bottom line, none of these problems go away until these commodity prices go a lot higher. Now, maybe, is it possible that doesn't happen over the next two years? Sure. Anything's possible. but you know, the longer that doesn't happen, I think the worse the problem gets on the back end of it. And we still have to see evidence, even though we had copper at $5, we did not have a lot of new copper mines come online. So just it, they were moving things along, heading towards feasibility studies for mines. But a lot of those potential projects are delayed or canceled. Look at, look at, your, look at uranium, right? Spot price of uranium in the last, what is it, 20 months has gone from 25 to 50? And I, I don't hold me to this, but I don't believe you've had a single new mine opening, uranium mine opening in the la over that period of time. There are some planned ones. So I think Kazataprom may have oh, increased did they? production. So Kazataprom, well, because they're the low cost producer, so they right. could increase production a little bit. And then Cameco said they might bring online their mines. And then I think there's a couple in Africa from some Australian producers that are incurred in maintenance. So those can restart. But I mean, if uranium prices either stay sideways or go lower, or there's a depression, that supply is not coming online. No, no, no. And that, and that's that's what I'm saying is you've pushed all of these commodities to a situation where the only way the supply and demand functions for them, in my opinion, is really nasty economic outcomes. And even then, because you're not bringing any, you know, let's say you lower global demand across the board for these commodities by 10 to 15%. That would be, if you did that, that would be a global depression. I mean, that would be 10 to 15% well, doesn't sound like a lot, but that, that is massive, right? The, wor the worst case was oil in the first quarter of 2020, right? Full lockdown. So that was one of the only one or two years out of the last 15 or 20 where oil demand totally collapsed for gasoline, jet fuel. And then what? We had the enormous snapback rally 12 months later. Right, so. right. Because there's just not enough. And that's the thing. And and you and I both understand this is that that problem cannot be addressed politically. It cannot be addressed monetarily. There is only one thing that will fix this problem across the entire com commodity complex, and that is investment. And that investment needs to happen whether or not you convert to green energy or not. It doesn't have anything to do with that. One of the biggest components into green energy is petro or, or, or fossil fuels. I it, it just the whole the whole thing is completely nonsensical. And like I said, the way that you know, and it's pro for the people listening to you and I probably don't need to know this. They probably already think this way, but th that's what irritates me the most about this whole climate change thing. I am not a quote unquote climate denier. I think that the world is getting warmer. I think that's pretty much undeniable. I question, 
I, I don't deny. I question man's impact on that. I think that weather cycles, I think it's foolish to believe we don't have any impact on it. I think it is really hard if you're just objectively looking at the data to come to the conclusions that we have the impact on it that many think we do. But be that as it may, let's take them serious at their word. Let's say that the situation is bad as they say it is and it's as acute as they say it is. Why in the hell are you advocating for solar fields and wind farms? And stuff? Why would you not be addressing this with nuclear? It just it doesn't pass the smell test. It's ridiculous. They go, oh well, it still has waste. Are you you the, are you are you saying so to solar? I mean, you're mining <laughs> rare earths in China. You're destroying the air, water, and soil. I mean, there's documentaries about how damaging to the environment mining rare earth <sighs> elements and separating them are. It's just it's not occurring here in the United States. It's occurring in China and everywhere around the mine site and the rare earth separation facilities is a toxic radioactive fallout zone. Oh, it's, 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 yeah, it's environmental disasters. It, it reminds me of like the bad guys back in the day on that, uh, that cartoon plant, you know, Captain Planet. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's horribly destructive and they go, what about nuclear waste? I don't think people understand how little uranium it takes to run one of these big reactors. And this is a way to put it into, into, uh, to make it conceptual. If you look at, if you look at a big reactor, so a, a big modern reactor, um, and you look at their total cost of running a reactor, right? The total cost, the maintenance, the employees, the whole thing, the, the, the health plans, the, the health insurance, the whole cost to run it. The cost to purchase uranium makes up slightly less than 4% of their total cost structure. And I think that kind of gives people an idea of how little of this stuff can be. So when you talk about nuclear waste, don't, you know, don't quote me on this because I'm not really sure what the payloads of these rockets are, but you know, I, I, I I would guess that you could probably load 100% of the world's nuclear waste from a year onto less than 10 SpaceX rockets and shoot into orbit every year, right? And, and maybe my math is off, but my point is when you look at what the cost of permanently dealing with that quote unquote nuclear waste would, and you look at the amount of wildlife and the amount of uh, uh, land that would be soaked up by solar fields and the amount of migratory bird patterns that would be altered and, and hampered by wind farms and all this other kind of stuff. You're worried about, you know, a couple handfuls of nuclear waste. Are you joking? So, um, and then that doesn't even, that doesn't even speak to the intermittence issue, right? Or the need for baseload power. It yeah, just, look at California. <laughs> oh my God. And that's just what makes me, that, that's what makes my head boil is I just sit there and I go, look, even if you're right, you're not even being true to your own objections. Meaning if you are honest and if you are being forthright about your intentions that you're just trying to eliminate fossil or, or carbon emissions, we can do that now. We have the technology. And that's the scary part of the equation is I don't believe these people are all that stupid. So then the next question becomes, then why won't they do it? Corruption. <laughs> I, they, yeah, I, there's not as much money in it, right? I mean, that's I, I'm with you 100% of the way. I mean, you know, it's like all these ESG funds coming out, and every time you run the S and P 500 through these ESG filters, you know, five or six out of the top 10 stocks that score the highest are energy companies. You know, so <laughs> it's, and it's and Goldman Sachs is going to be a market maker for carbon cap and trade, and they're just going to they're going to create a new market. They're going to get a cut of everything. Governments are going to get to tax things more with a carbon tax. It's it's all about taxes and corruption. Unfortunately, when the government gets involved and uh, they've mucked up the energy situation, I mean, OPEC controlling. OPEC's not proper, in my opinion, OPEC's not properly, the national oil companies are not properly reinvesting into oil and natural gas. They're not replacing their reserves. They're not adequately growing production. The Nigerian national oil company in Venezuela can't make consistent profits with oil at these levels or can't grow their production, then there's something wrong. I mean, a private sector company could easily, yeah, if well, uh, governments I, weren't, uh, weren't taxing them or ruining them with rules and regulations. And I think you actually make a really good point there, which is, Look at all of these. There are a couple examples um, where it does work. I believe there's a. It doesn't doesn't Norway have nationalized oil production that it operates at a profit? Yes, and they have an enormous sovereign wealth fund too. So yeah, yeah. 
So, and no, and that, I mean, if you think about it culturally, it doesn't surprise me that the Norwegians are able to be disciplined and run a, run a profitable oil field. And I mean that as a compliment. Um, but you named all those. I mean, let's go back through the, the list of governments who have destroyed their energy cap or energy production capability is 10x the list of where it's worked. And, um, if that is the answer, and that seems to be the direction they're going, right? Everybody's already starting to float around the idea of caps, price caps. You just sit back and go, oh my God, you people just won't learn, will you? And so again, I just kind of sit back and I think, you know what, we'll just hold these things until they're valued correctly because, you know, eventually physics will win out and these it's things will be valued appropriately and, and the governments that make these ridiculous decisions, they will be dealt with. And, um, and, and the other thing too is – I actually think based on that dynamic that you pointed out, which is undeniable, um, I think that that impulse as this problem gets more acute for those governments to seize production of energy, that only makes the entire situation that much worse, right? I mean, that just you yep. want to see the efficiency of an oil field drop, watch it get nationalized. And you've seen it over and over and over again. And um, look at Venezuela. I mean, there was oh my a God. There was private sector oil companies. I, I've interviewed. I'm, I worked with Robert Rapier. He worked for ConocoPhillips when they were investing in Venezuela. And as soon as uh, Venezuelan oil production by ConocoPhillips became profitable, the assets were taken. So yep, yep. And then and then what happened to them? Right. I mean, what is their oil production now? Isn't it like it's totally 50, collapsed since 2007? So I think it's it was down like 85, 90 percent, something like that. It's a disaster. The Chinese government's in there. The Russian government's in there. The Iranian government's in there. They're all fighting over the oil service contracts and claims on the assets. It's a total disaster. It screwed over the Venezuelan people. Uh, the only people who have really profited are the cronies for Hugo Chavez and Maduro. Well, and their kids. Some of their Instagram uh, uh, accounts are pretty lavish. You know, they, they, <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. having a good time, right? They're having a great time. So no, it's a it's a disaster, and and I think. Um, and and I think if there's one silver lining to this is that I, I, again, in my lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen a scenario that has the potential to highlight the dangers and the damage of nationalizing assets and going the socials, the so socialism route um, as the current situation. So my hope is, is that I don't think there's any way around this energy crisis. I think, like I said, I think it's going to be a series of rolling crises for years. Um, and my hope is the one benefit that comes out is it impacts a new generation of investors that realizes, hey, that sounds like a good fix right now, but I remember the costs and we don't want to go that route. You know, kind of like the German, the, the impact on Germany for so many years after the Weimar Republic. Um, now, I think Germany's forgot those lessons. Um, I think it's hard to argue they haven't, um, but you know, it, th those lessons lasted a good 70 years, 60 years, no, 80 years. Um, and so I, I you know, I kind of look at it trying to think optimistically um, silver lining is maybe this will teach a generation of people, especially young people that socialism and governments taking charge isn't the right answer because we've seen that creeping advance of government, especially in the last 20 years. And the more it happens, the more the populace seems to wave it on or encourage it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, let, let's see if they're that let, – let's see if they're that fired up about it when they're paying 10 to 12 bucks at the pump. Um, Amen. Especially with stagflation and taxes and the central banks have created that and then bad energy policy compounding it. And the, the government's created all the supply chain issues. So in the private sector, if you're a small business owner, entrepreneur, or corporation, you could fix the supply chain issues – there would be temporarily higher prices, but the supply chains could get fixed. Governments are still not allowing the supply chains to get fixed. No, and and then and this goes to my whole broader look of the market. When you add all those things up, again, I've done this long enough to know that I do not have a crystal ball. I'm not the one genius on Twitter that knows exactly where the market's going. Uh, I hate to break it to everybody, but nobody does. But when you add all those things up, specifically the impact on consumers that these current issues are having, and I look at a dollar index where it is, and I look at commodity prices where there are, and energy prices, and I look at Europe, and I look at Japan. I, I just don't understand. And you then you recognize that uh, here in the United States, 70% of our economy is based on consumer spending. I don't understand how in the world you have a 8 to 9% in, you know, uh, increase in profits target for the S&P over the next 12 months. Uh, we, we have tried to do the work. I can't get there mathematically. I mean – 
I think if you have a 15 to 20% hit to earnings over the next 16 months in the S&P, I think that will be a soft landing. Oh yeah, I, I, costs are up easily for many businesses, oh. well over ten percent. So I don't know where these uh, prof, uh, <sighs> earnings increases are coming from if costs are rising that much and the consumer is either not spending or trading down. Yeah, I, I just, I, I can't, I just can't get there from here. And everybody's looking at the current numbers, and we were saying coming into this year, we were like, look, we, we think this year will be the beginning of the recession, but we don't even think you'll start seeing it show up in the data till late in third quarter because. Think, think of all the consumer spending that was pushed off over the last two years, waiting for that first summer off of lockdown. You know, and anecdotally, how many of us know weddings that got delayed until this year, family trips that got delayed until this year? People were going to spend this year regardless. Okay, so a test of the economy is not the numbers you're looking at right now. It's going to be what those numbers look like at the end of the third and fourth quarter. The troubling part about that is if you're somebody that looks at leading indicators, and I think the one that was the most dramatic that we've seen recently was the G5 credit impulse, it's falling off a cliff. The G5 credit impulse is at a 20 is 20% lower than it was at the COVID bottom. I mean, there's just no appetite for lending and there's no new loans being made. And again, you know, think about like I've been telling our listeners, look at what's going on in the dollar index, right? The yen has depreciated, what, 30 to 35% against the dollar in the last 12 months? Okay, I'm not saying Japanese people are going to buy less iPhones, but they're going to buy less of them, right? Look at you, look at Germany, look at look at Europe. What in the last, you know, 18 months was the euro the euro's depreciated 30 per another, yeah, 30% against the dollar too. And now they're playing 10x on their power bills. I I, I just don't understand how you think that the world is going to continue to buy as much of our goods, let alone more, uh, especially on a dollar denominated basis. I mean, get out of here. I just, I, I just don't see how it works. And once these retailers like Best Buy, Walmart, Target, once they have the sales and they clear the inventory for these consumer discretionary, they clear those, they're planning on raising prices in the future because they still have higher costs and higher supply chain problems. So they're going to have sales and they're going to slash and burn the inventory for the discretionary items. And once they do that, they're not going to reorder and the stuff they do reorder is going to be at higher prices. So the, well, the Wall Street analysts are not calculating that yet either. And yeah, well, and as, an, and as an Austrian economist, you you know just as well as I do that what is stimulus? It's just pulling forward future demand. Okay, let's think about what happened in the last two years. Um, if you've bought a barbecue in the last two years, you're not going to buy another one this year. Yep. If you've redone your deck, in the last two years, you're not going to redo it again. If you remodeled your house, you're not going to do it again. They're all, I mean, literally, if you were a consumer and you wanted a new GI Joe with a Kung Fu grip, you bought it and you probably bought four of them. You bought your new Jordans, you bought your flat screen TV. At the very least, at the very least, I don't care what any economist says, at the very least, you're entering an air pocket in the third quarter of this year of consumer spending that should last at least four to six quarters. Just, just by definition of things being more expensive and people already bought everything, right? So I, I can't find, I was having a joke with another analyst buddy of mine and he's like, do you agree with this chart? And I said, not only do I agree with it, I go, I can't find a leading indicator that says anything, but not, not good. That's really bad. I mean, think about that. The G5 credit impulse is 20% lower than it was at the COVID bottom when the economy was shut. Um, China I, credit know, impulse has totally collapsed too. The Chinese government's trying to force Chinese banks to start giving out loans, but the loans are going to go bad. Real estate prices are crashing. So yeah, the problems are even worse in China. They're mag more magnified. I, and and I that just leads to me to a current, I just think the pressure is building on them to take a 30 to 40% haircut on the one. I, I just, it, and, and now, okay, now think about that, right? If, and you and I know this again, you, I know you're reading the same stuff. When you read through a lot of these S and P 500 companies, the lion's share of the vast majority of their growth plans is further penetrating the Chinese economy. Okay, what happens if you get a 30, 40 percent devaluation of the yuan? Not even let's say the DXY pulls back, but let's say they've got to devalue the yuan by 30 percent, which is pretty conservative when when you're looking at the numbers in China. And to give people an idea. What the the total real the total value of U.S. real estate is like at thirty trillion in China it's eighty five, right? And then and yet our economy is still running at twenty what is it fifteen twenty percent larger than theirs, so that seems a little off kilter, right? But um, think of what happens to those growth projections of these U.S. companies if they devalue their currency by thirty percent. I mean, poof.
There it goes. Yeah. Right. The so consumers not their consumers not going to have purchasing power. Their consumer is going to be worried about the basic things get, becoming way more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. I just I don't I don't I I don't see a way out of this one, buddy. I sure don't see a way out of one yeah. where multiples expand here on the S and P five hundred, and this is the beginning of a bull run. I just don't see it. Yeah, not unless the currency totally collapses and then asset prices go up, but then like that's not real growth. Zach, uh, I've kept you for over an hour. I think we could go on and on way over an hour. (laughs) (laughs) I had a blast, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll have to have you back on in the next couple months to come back on for a follow-up. There was a lot of topics we didn't get to. So if my listeners want to take a look at your iTunes show, maybe take a look at um, the, the fund that you manage, how did they do so? Yeah, so I think probably the easiest way, you can follow me on Twitter at KYR Radio. You can go to our website at at BulwarkCapitalMGMT.com, so BulwarkCapitalManagement.com. Like I said, you can get the podcast. uh, You can listen to the show. There's plenty there. And then at some point, pal, like you and I have talked about, we got to do a home and away. We got to get you on the show, and I'm going to flip the script on you and uh, be the guy that gets to ask you the questions. Okay, that sounds good as long as it's not in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we'll get we'll get you in the afternoon, man. <laughs>